in this session I'm going to uh, take some time to talk about hepatitis B and C. It's a very large topic, so I cannot cover everything. What I'm going to do is just focus on some of the new developments in the management of hepatitis B and C. As you all may know, we are going through almost at a revolutionary pace in the management of hepatitis C. If someone were to ask me what were the major developments in gastroenterology and hepatology in the last 25 years, I would say liver transplant was a big development, H. pylori was a major breakthrough, and a TNF in inflammatory bowel disease made a change, and now we are seeing a revolution in the management of hepatitis C. And um, hopefully in the next few years, with one or two pills, we may cure most people with hepatitis C. So when you look at the world map, you can see the prevalence of hepatitis C varies. And about 200 million people around the world have hepatitis C almost 3% of the world population. And it is the most common cause of liver cancer in the world, at least in the Western countries, after hepatitis B. And it is the most common cause of liver transplant in the developed world. Almost 50% of liver transplant are done for hepatitis C. And with Columbia, there was a publication, I think the main author from Brazil, published just recently in PLOS uh, online journal. They reviewed or they examined about 670 patients from four separate parts of the country and looked at the prevalence of hepatitis B, C, and Delta uh, in this part of the world. And they looked at both rural and urban population. And what is surprising, I know it is a busy slide, is about 28% of the population had previous exposure to hepatitis B. Almost one in three. And when you look at hepatitis B surface and the genemia, about 5.6% had active hepatitis B infection, much higher than one would have anticipated. And most worrying feature is the younger population, the 16 to 20, there were almost 8.6% hepatitis B. As a developing country, this is a concern because we had hepatitis B vaccine for well, more than three decades. So we are not trying to prevent hepatitis B in our younger population. When you look at hepatitis C, it's about 3.6% of the population, much higher than the Western European countries and uh, North America, almost twice as high. When they looked at the genotype, almost 90% had genotype 1B. That is a promising sign because we know from the direct acting antiviral drugs that genotype 1B will be relatively easy to treat in the next few years. So we have come a long way. When I started treating hepatitis C, the cure rate of hepatitis C was about 5% with interferon three times a week. With two drug combination, pegylated interferon ribavirin, we reached with genotype 1 about 50%. And about 18 months ago, at least in the United States and in Europe, a third group of drugs were released, protease inhibitor, NS3A protease inhibitor. When you use it in combination with pegylated interferon ribavirin, the cure rate went up to 79% in the treatment naive patient population. So this is a, a major breakthrough. But it is an expensive treatment. Protease inhibitors, what is currently available in the market, 
have major side effects drug rash anemia nausea and more importantly it is expensive very expensive three months of treatment of telaprevir will cost fifty thousand US dollars in the US so most patients will not be able to afford and moreover in my experience it is very difficult to tolerate the three drug regime than we had previously anticipated so there are number of drugs number of class of drugs we are uh, in the uh, seeing the development stage and as 3a protease has high potency but has only limited genotypic coverage that may not be very important in this country because most of the patients here have genotype 1b but it is not very effective for genotype 2 3 a, and other genotypes ns 5a inhibitors initially developed by bristol myers cube has very high potency it is covers multiple gen, uh, genotypes but the resistant barrier to resistance is only intermediate and ns5b inhibitors there are two groups the nucleoside and non-nucleoside the nucleoside analogs we may have heard about pharmacet which developed the first potent drug in this group has intermediate potency but covers all genotypes and has a very high barrier to resistance at least the drugs that are available by the pharmacist has very low side effect. NS5B non-nucleoside analog, the problem is it has a low barrier to resistance and again limited genotypic coverage. So the most of the drugs in development are better NS3A protease inhibitor, NS5A inhibitors and nucleoside NS5B inhibitors. And what we anticipate is using a combination of these three molecules direct acting antiviral drugs we will cure hepatitis C in the near future in almost all patients so when we look at the published data on NS3 a protease inhibitor the two drugs that are approved worldwide now telaprevir and bosiprevir uh, this is from the based on the product information because on the published data and the product information there are some discrepancy so when you look at the treatment naive group about 79 percent got cured with uh, uh, telaprevir and with bosiprevir is 63 percent there was there was no head-to-head -head comparison so it's very difficult to compare these two drugs so we could say that 65 to 75 percent will get cured when you look at the treatment experience patient those who fail the two drugs it is not as good if the patient has a relapser it is excellent you will get almost 86 percent with telaprovir and 70 percent with bosiprovir if there were null responders that means if they had less than two log decline of hepatitis c rna after 12 weeks of treatment with pegylated interferon and ribavirin the response rate is going to be 30 percent and if they have cirrhosis it will be even less about 14 percent so null responders people who do not respond to interferon they're not going to respond to three drug regime the partial responder people who fall in between they're not relapsed they had more than two log decline but never became undetectable or they had a breakthrough their response rate is somewhere intermediate between 40 to 60 percent so we're not there yet with complete cure of hepatitis C and one of the developments in the last two years was identifying our own genes whether we can predict who is going to respond IL-28B was located in chromosome a single mutation of the you know can cost recent uh, amino acid mutation may predict who is going to respond to interferon so IL-28B which uh, appears to have uh, appears to have major role in the hepatitis C clearance and genetic variation seen all over the world and the better genotype is CC seen in about 20% of the portion population cure rate 
whether you treat with the interferon ribavirin or three drug regime, it's same. About 80% get cured. When it's a heterogeneous C or CT or homozygous TT, response rate is very low. So we are learning more about our own host genome that will predict who is going to respond to treatment. So we have looked at the IL-28B genotype. On the left-hand side, CC, whether the, uh, I haven't marked it, if whether it's interferon ribavirin or 3 drug regime, it really didn't make a difference. About 80% got cured, irrespective of whether it's 3 drug or 2 drug. But on the right-hand side, you can see that 3 drugs did definitely better for other genotypes like CT and TT. There is a difference still between CC, CT and TT, but the difference is much smaller now with three drug regime. So direct acting antiviral drugs, the role of IL-28B is probably marginalized. And same thing with bosiprovir and teleprovir in treatment experience. There is a difference, but the difference is not as big as pegylated interferon and ribovirin. So what about the new developments? The treatment currently is six months in majority of patients with three drugs. About 40% may require 48 weeks of treatment. Many of our patients will not be combined with a longer duration. And it has significant side effects, significant morbidity, very expensive. And most countries in the world cannot afford this three drug regime in majority of their patient population. So, so we need a shorter duration. And the, most of the side effects of hepatitis C treatment is interferon. So the next one is to get rid of interferon because it has to be also given subcutaneously. And the third one, that is where the low, in and, low and middle income countries need to focus on. We need to have an affordable treatment, a pill that could be applied to everyone in this world. So one of the drugs in development, in that it is in phase three now, was initially developed by Pharmacet and then recently bought by Gilead for a 6.8 billion for a single molecule. So this is a nucleoside NS5B inhibitor. And the, in, it, when you use it in combination with interferon ribavirin, it gives excellent outcome. More than 80% got cured irrespective of the genotype. So the question is, could we use it for a shorter course of treatment instead of six months or a year? Could we treat them for 12 weeks? That could be easily managed, at least in, from a compliance point of view. So this was a study presented at the ESL meeting this year. They had three groups. First group had this nucleoside NS5B inhibitor in combination with the standard of care that is speculated interferon ribovirin. The group B, they were treated for 24 weeks instead of 20, 12 weeks, all genotype 1. And the third group, after 12 weeks, they were randomized either to GS7977 or GS7977 with ribovirin. So the three groups, the aim was to see whether we can treat them for three months instead of six months. So when you look at the orange line, because when this, it was presented, they didn't have 24 weeks SVR in two groups. When you look at that, the cure rate with the three drug, whether you treat it with 12 weeks or 24 weeks, is 90% and above. And the longer duration really did not make any difference. And same group and others have shown that if the hepatitis C is undetectable at week four after treatment, if you use a sensitive assay, it doesn't matter. You don't have to wait for 12 weeks or 24. So SVR4 is as good as SVR12 or SVR24. So we can say that with this new molecule, genotype one, the most difficult group, we can cure 90% of the patients with 12 weeks of treatment. This is a, going to be a big breakthrough in the way we manage. But it still uses interferon, the drug most patients hate to take.
because it has a lot of side effects. So what about the next strategy? We need to get rid of interferon for us to use it in our large population. And it is poorly tolerated. It, has exp it is expensive. It has to be administered subcutaneously. This is one of the study I participated. Um, we enrolled 44 patients with genotype 1 and a similar number genotype 2 and 3. Interferon was not used here. We used a protease a, a NS5A inhibitor with an NS5B, the same drug that Gilead has now. No protease inhibitor. And one group had ribavirin added. So this was used for genotype 1, 2, and 3. All oral drug, no interferon. So the third arm had ribavirin added to this. There were 44 patients without cirrhosis with genotype 1, 44 genotype 2 and 3. And the first two groups received two drugs for 24 weeks. The third group used three drugs, ribavirin added into the mix of but all oral drugs. The median decline in hepatitis C RNA was excellent, 4.4 log at week day 7. And adding ribavirin to this combination, unlike the pegylated interferon trial, did not make any difference. So all future trials you may see, we may not use ribavirin because it causes anemia too. And 100%, all of them, had undetectable RNA at week 4. And this is shown at week uh, 4 and week 12. The one missing data was with the patient did not have the blood test done. So genotype 1, two drugs, both oral, we had undetectable virus at week 4. Same more or less with genotype 2 and 3. Not as good because they lost some patients in that study group. So what about SVR? That is the cure. When you look at the genotype 1, 100% got cured. All genotype 1 patient had cure with two drugs, 24 weeks of treatment. Genotype 2 and 3, they only 40 out of 44 had a uh, cure. Of the four that did not respond at SVR, uh, two had undetectable virus during follow-up because their uh, primary endpoint was SVR4, so they could not report that. So uh, two of them cleared in the subsequent one. One had a relapse, one had a breakthrough. So in this study, of the eight, only two patients did not clear the virus if you mix the genotype 2 and 3 with the genotype 1. This was presented at the ESL and we hopefully will be presented at ASLD and it is currently submitted for publication. This is going to be an important breakthrough in the way we manage hepatitis C. And when you look at the IL-28B, there was no difference whether it's CT or TT. 100% cure with two drugs. So two oral drug combination for 24 weeks and an NS5A inhibitor in combination with an NS5B will give you cure in more than 90% of our patient populations. And studies are in progress evaluating the same protocol for 12 weeks. Although I am not at the liberty to show you the data, the early results look fantastic and 12 weeks look as good as 24 weeks. So what about those who failed the previous interferon ribavirin? And the two drug in that group did not look as good. This was published by Analog in New England Journal of Medicine recently. For that group, it looks like you need quadruple therapy. That means two drugs plus pegylated interferon ribavirin. I will not go through the details of this study. When you look at the left group, they had only two drugs. And the right, they had four drugs. When you see there is an initial decline, but then there is a breakthrough in those people who were null responders. That means they had low, very poor response interferon. Whereas when you added interferon and ribavirin, they had a sustained response. And as you can see in that, group P with four drugs, they had 100% clearance. And compared to the other group, 
two drugs very low, 36%. And in this, one of the patients had detectable virus at follow-up, but subsequent work showed that that patient also cleared. So four drug in null responders, that is the most difficult one you will see, had excellent response, 100% accurate. When they looked at the two drugs, uh, two patients with genotype 1B, that's what you will see in this country, both of them cured even with two drugs in that group. So 90% of them had um, un unfavorable IL-28B, that's CTOTT. And most patients were genotype, the most difficult one to treat. And it was an excellent response. So we are seeing almost like a breakthrough, just like we saw in H. pylori treatment, or how it modified the ulcer. In, you know, we are going to cure hepatitis C majority. I never expected in my professional life I will see that two or drugs will cure most patients with hepatitis C. So when there is money, I think there will be pharmaceutical company trying to develop the best treatment. As you can see, there are many drugs in the developmental stages. So now changing the topic, hepatitis B, even a bigger problem worldwide. Almost 400 million people have hepatitis B. As you saw in Colombia, about 5.6 percent will have hepatitis B. Quite a high prevalence, and about a third of the patients had previous exposure to hepatitis B. An important point to note because this is a preventable disease. This is the only vaccine that has shown to reduce the risk of cancer anywhere in the world. So when you look at that, it is a more serious disease. And we are not at a stage where we can cure hepatitis B until we find a drug which can work against CCC DNA. Hepatitis B is preventable, or we can, uh, uh, and it can be put and uh, kept under uh, control. But we can never cure. It's a major cause of liver disease and one of the most common causes of liver cancer in the world. And again, we have made uh, major advances here in the treatment. We rarely transplant someone with hepatitis B for liver failure. When hepatitis B patients come for liver transplantation, at least in Western Europe and North America, it is for liver cancer, not because of liver failure. Because our treatment, now it's very efficacious, even in patients with advanced liver disease. This is a variety of drugs. I would say one needs to focus on two drugs now, tinefovir and endecovir. These drugs have high resistance, barrier to resistance. So these are going to be the standard drugs we will be used. Other drugs probably will not be used in the future. And both drugs are very efficacious. But the zero conversion rate after one year of treatment with these all drugs is about 20%, irrespective of how uh, strong this drug is. But as you keep this patient on a longer term, more and more people will zero convert as we have seen. And E antigen negative, which probably will represent about 50% of the population, again the response rate is excellent with this drug because they start with a low viral count and these drugs are very efficacious. But the treatment is going to be lifelong in this patient or until the surface antigen clears. And as you can see, when the, uh, when you, the virus goes down, ALT improves and histology improves. Even with cirrhosis, even with advanced cirrhosis, the response rate with tinefovir and decavir is excellent. Many of these patients, even decompensated liver disease, they become compensated if you, can, if you get enough time to treat them with either one of these drugs. The problem with uh, hepatitis B, it is a more complex virus, and it has been with, you know, we ha can see hepatitis B in the mummies, which are 2,000 years old. So the, the virus has developed ways to develop resistance when it is under put a pressure on this drug. And most of the commonly used drugs in the past, like lemivudine, very high resistance after five years, 80% develop resistance. But not with tinefovir. It is a nucleotide analog, very high potency, as of five years, they have not seen a drug resistant. Same with entecovir. If you were to treat with 
treatment naive patient population resistance is very low but if you use endecavir which is a nucleoside analog in patients who had previous exposure to lamivudin or other nucleoside analog there is a very high risk of resistance so if one were to ask what is the first line drug in people who have never had any exposure endecavir or tenofovir both comparable but patients who had previous exposure to lamivudin the drug of choice will be tenofovir what about using combination this is uh, you know although we clear the virus in many patients it is not 100% and this was tested in a trial recently and presented at ASLD last year there was an open label st uh, study 379 patients were treated with two drug and compared with endecavir alone so when you look at this there was no real difference between the combination group but if you look at the subgroup that had more than 100 million copies or international unit there was a difference the combination group did better this the authors summarized that although it was a small number if someone has E antigen positive hepatitis B and DNA levels are very high more than 100 million international unit one may consider a combination treatment of endecavir and tenofovir otherwise monotherapy is as good as um, combination therapy and the safety profile is excellent combining a nucleoside analog with a nucleotide analog the next question I think many of my patients ask um, if I have cirrhosis is it going to be reversible I think my answer used to be it is unlikely but we learn we knew that it is a dynamic change fibrosis is a dynamic change but we never had any data except for anecdotal experience of few patients so two groups both the, uh, those uh, Bristol Myers and Gilead looked at this in a long-term study this was uh, a study that was presented at the ESL meeting this year this is a study which is an extension of their uh, registration trial they initially treated this patient randomized to adifivir or tenofovir and both groups then went into open label tenofovir they did biopsy in majority of patients at the beginning and at five years and they had 348 patients who underwent biopsy at five years of 641 person so approximately 50 person had biopsy at time zero and time five time five years when you look at the ishak fibrosis score five and six are established cirrhosis and when you look at the baseline more than 25 percent had cirrhosis and at year five only 12 percent had cirrhosis even if one were to assume that there is some sampling error this is a large data set majority of patients with cirrhosis did not show any evidence of cirrhosis at year five and studies with endecavir with a smaller data set have shown the same thing so this is this is very robust we can say cirrhosis is reversible in this study 74 percent of patients with cirrhosis did not have cirrhosis after five years of treatment this is you know, something none of us would have predicted and if you look at the number of uh, grades they went down a significant num uh, percentage of the patients had a reduction in scoring by three or four points so Ishak score goes from uh, zero to six so this is an amazing finding so they looked at this uh, analyzed this data why didn't 26 percent improve are there anything that could predict who is not going to respond to treatment as you can see the only predictor other than treatment was 
obesity. The patients who did not respond or who did not have regression of cirrhosis were obese. And in a multivariate analysis, that was the only independent predictor that would tell them who did not reverse or not. So again, we come to a, another topic of NAFL here. Many of these patients may have underlying fatty liver disease in addition to hepatitis B or obesity or steatosis modulate even the effect of antiviral treatment. So in summary, one could say hepatitis C is potentially curable in almost all patients. And in the near future, we are going to see short-term treatment and also non-interferon-based th treatment. That will become the standard of care. Hepatitis B is not curable yet, but it is controllable in majority of patients. And cirrhosis, we are learning, is potentially reversible. It is not a permanent change. The major challenge that we would see, all these developments are going to help uh, only a minority of people in the high-income countries. But majority of patients with hepatitis C and B live in low-income and middle-income countries. To be effective, to change the natural history, change the world epidemiology, we need to have treatment that could be used for everyone. I think that is going to be a major challenge to convince the pharmaceutical company to bypass huge profit. Just like we had in HIV, there has to be a concerted effect to do that. Thank you.